You are now listening to the Performance Physical Therapy Better Faster Podcast. Today's host is Dr. Michelle Colley, CEO of Performance Physical Therapy. On today's show, she has Dr. Dave Pabo, Chief Clinical Officer at Performance Physical Therapy, Dr. Ram Tabador, Orthopedic Surgeon at University Orthopedics, Dr. Kevin Alexander, Physical Therapist at our East Greenwich location, Jen Gallant, Director of Athletic Training at Performance Physical Therapy, and Patrick Moulton, General Manager at Roadrunner. What a joy it is to be here today with my colleague and friend, Dr. Dave Pavo. Dave, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Michelle. It's always a pleasure. Well, it's so fun to actually be in person. And for those people who are listening, you will hear some summer sounds, such as leaf blowing outside and things like that. And um, the pitter patter of people out there moving more as our days are much longer, the temperatures are warmer, and we seem to be in a much better place because of COVID. But today, what we're here to talk about is how to minimize the risk of injuries, how to help people get out and get moving. And I can't think of a better person to join me with this than someone who I know who's a runner, a golfer, maybe a fisherman, a lot of, a dad, all of these things. So obviously movement is a key thing of your, key part of your lifestyle. Thanks, Michelle. I try try to be all of the above. And uh, just these last couple weeks on Father's Day, I brought uh, Aiden, my six-year-old son, golfing for the first time. So that is opening up a whole new uh, opportunity for sneaking out of the house a little more. Well, you can't sneak out on your own anymore. (laughs) Now your kids are at the age where you have to take them (laughs) with you. So here we are today. I'm excited. We're going to hear about industry leaders when it comes to things such as golf, choosing the best running shoe, how to manage our athletes who are in college, middle school, high school, um, hear about things like Peloton hips. So lots of different guests on this show. But one thing for sure is what we've seen from the pandemic is two different kinds of people. Those who were really active before the pandemic, during the pandemic, shut down and did nothing, and now they're on this trajectory to suddenly think they can bounce back to where they were. Then we have this other group of people who weren't particularly active before the pandemic, but have seen the pandemic as an opportunity to learn and want to try new things and take a little better care of themselves, who are sort of so starting fresh. So, So thinking about all of those kinds of people who are now trying to do a little bit more, um, you know, what kind of advice do you have for them, Dave? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That's a great question. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from all these great experts you have lined up as well, because we're hearing this from people in the community and we're experiencing it ourselves, including myself. My wife and I were in that group that said we got to get moving and we got a treadmill and we got a Peloton recently. So we're absolutely hopping on that train. And yet we're seeing this in our clinics too, right? So people aren't just feeling it out there. We're seeing it in our clinics. Our therapists are experiencing it. One really interesting fact that absolutely jumps off the table at you is one study found that people probably gained an average of 1.5 pounds per month during the lockdown period. So that's so significant. And, and that level of inactivity, that weight gain was for a lot of reasons, right? We're inactive, we're stressed, and it affects our, our physical health and it affects our mental health. And we've now started to see the changes happen as the sun's out, everybody's feeling a little bit better. Um, but as you said, some folks are ramping up a little too quickly or simply looking for advice on a way forward. So I think this is a perfect, timely topic. Yeah. So for those people who may have put on a little bit of extra poundage, you've obviously got to be mindful of your diet and mm-hmm. nutrition. We won't get too much into that today. We'll focus a little bit more on movement. So what are some overall guidelines about how much someone should expect from their body? How much is enough, but not too much? Maybe that's the better question. Yeah, perfect. I think we can talk about the goal, but then talk about the, the way to get there because everybody's going to be starting in a different place. So the goal is 30 minutes of physical activity, especially aerobic activity. So we're talking get your heart rate up a little bit, get the blood flowing, car cardio type exercises, shoot for 30 minutes of activity at least four or five days a week. That's just a really good recommendation for everyone for optimal health. But I find it really important to emphasize that starting small is perfectly fine for people. Mm-hmm. 10 minutes a day, you're still actually going to get all the positive effects that people talk about, which is feeling better, sleeping a little bit better, starting to lose a little bit of weight. 10 minutes a day is a perfect way to start, especially for somebody who's who's not sure where to start or, or doesn't know how quickly to ramp up. 
So today I'm going to be asking lots of questions to all of our guests about fact or fiction. Mm -hmm. And one of my questions was, fact or fiction, you need to do at least 20 minutes a day to, to make it worth your while to exercise. Fiction, fiction, especially for those who, who aren't sure where to start. I'd say any amount of activity is a good way to start if you're starting from scratch. Uh, 10 minutes is a good place to start because there's plenty of research that shows it has positive effects. But even if somebody can exercise five minutes in, in, at a time, or maybe five minutes two or three times a day, um, and, and don't forget that things like gardening and, and a short walk, those activities count too. So start with small wins and let that momentum build. Uh, great points. And you bring up gardening, you bring up walking. You'd also brought up that you had invested in, like many people, a Peloton and a treadmill, and I'm right with you on that one. Um, but now that the weather is nicer, um, it's easier to get outside. Can you speak a little bit, if you've got the choice of whether to get outside and exercise or stay inside in your basement and ride your Peloton, which one should you choose and why? So I think the most pragmatic answer is whichever one gets you moving, right? So uh, I personally try to get outside, right? The season here in New England is a little bit short. <laughs> it feels especially short after everything we went through over the past year. So I think there's a lot of positive effects of being outside, the fresh air, uh, being out in nature. There's a lot of good mental health effects to it as well. So I try to eat that up as much as I can. But if you're the type of person who has a busy day and you need to fit in that, that Peloton workout, um, um, while, you know, maybe multitasking a little bit or after putting the kids to bed and you can't get out, if you're moving and it works for you, then that's perfect. So another fact or fiction, and this comes up often, when you do strength training, people often think, you know, we all need to do some kind of resistive training a couple of times a week, working all the major muscle groups in our body. We can't just do cardiovascular. It's important to do some resistive training. But some people say, oh, you know, to do enough, um, you know, do I need to have soreness? Do I need to have post-exercise muscle soreness? Fact or fiction, to get the strength benefits that we want from resistive, resistive training, you should get some soreness in the days that follow. I'm going to say that's mostly fiction, Michelle. I know people often think of that as the goal, and that's a perfectly fine goal if you're young and, and depending on what your goals are, you're trying to overload those muscles a little bit. But that feeling of soreness varies a lot, right? It can vary based on your fitness level to begin with. It can vary based on your age. So it's not necessarily the goal to chase after. I think the goal to chase after is do, a, do an amount of weight that you could do in general, 8 to 10, 8 to 12 repetitions, even two sets, two to three sets of that uh, is perfectly fine to, to get the muscle and the bone benefits of working out. And even things like body weight are perfectly fine. Body weight squats or using the tools you have in the house are fine. So as you can see, I'm a big proponent of starting with where you are and what you got. Dave, you like to make everything easy and you make everything look easy. Let's see what some of our other guests have to say about moving this summer and how to avoid and minimize the risk of injuries. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Michelle. Dr. Ron Tabador, it is so great to see you. And Thank what's you. super exciting is this is the first get together in person that I've done with anyone in almost a year and a half. Yeah, it's so exciting to be maskless right now. Isn't it? Yes. I know I feel a little bit naked. I do too. I do too. <laughs> I work best that way. It's, okay. so. it's great. Well, listen, we've had you on the show before. We've talked before. We understand you are the expert when it comes to the hip. I like to call you the hip doc. And um, you are the team physician at URI. You're an orthopedic surgeon at a university ortho. You've been here in Rhode Island for quite some time, seen lots of changes go on, mm -hmm. the most challenging being in the last year, but things are moving into a positive direction now. We were talking before this about all of the weekend warriors and people who maybe hadn't been as active suddenly coming out, returning to getting the health care they need, returning to the playing fields. Tell me, what are you seeing in your office? Yeah, it's, it's such a different landscape right now. And trying to kind of understand like what the injury patterns are is really unpredictable. It's, it's hard. Uh, so everyone that's been dormant over the last year and has gained the you know the, the COVID nineteen pounds and mm -hmm. they're really very kind of self aware of it and anxious. 
they're all just running to gyms that are now opened up. Um, they're doing facilities uh, that, are, that weren't available before. They're doing these kind of boot camps. And they're going from like zero to 60 in like two seconds. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing a lot of people that are doing things that their body is not quite accustomed to. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing this rise in these kind of like overuse injuries. Um, you're seeing a lot of like muscular tendon injuries and pulls and strains. So we're kind of managing that. We're also kind of managing people's like expectations and also trying to kind of help them temper them and so that they can pace themselves. And I'm sure a lot of the physical therapists are trying to manage that as well. Well, it's nice to see, or I shouldn't say it's nice to see, but it's comforting to see you're seeing the same thing in your offices as what we're seeing in the clinics. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty pervasive. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's funny because I, I kind of found two patterns during COVID. Mm -hmm. There were the people that were really active and they became super dormant. And then you have these people that were dormant, not very active, but now they get to work from home. They're not commuting all the time. They're not in their car all the time. And so now they're out saying, I'm gonna start running, I'm gonna start exercising, uh, get healthier. Those are the people that are actually in better shape right now or in a better place to kind of manage the changes than those that just basically were active, not active, now trying to be active again. And the problem is that when people start getting active, they, in their head, they think that they can do the things that they were able to do prior to becoming inactive. And so you can lift, I don't know, if you can do 50 pound go you know, curls mm -hmm. and they haven't done it for like a year, they're going to go back to the gym, pick up those 50 pound weights and try to do those curls. And then they're going to pop their biceps tendon. And it's like, yeah, you've been away from the gym for a year. You need to kind of start lower and work your way back up. But that's the biggest danger. The biggest danger is thinking in your head that you are capable of doing exactly what you're able to do mm -hmm. before you basically kind of went into the state. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good message that you bring up because if you told me that example as a PT, I'd say, yeah, you lift too much weight, you're going to get some muscle soreness. But you bring up something actually that's more real or more concerning, and that is, no, you could pop your biceps tendon. I mean, and that's a game changer. That's a life changer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's great for us, for business, um, but it's, it's not something you want. Yeah. And now here you are trying to get back and exercise. You have this injury that has now put you out another four to six months. Mm -hmm. So as people get prepared to start doing a little more activity over the summer, whether they were active before or sedentary before, what are the key guidelines that you give the patients or give people that you see? So... I have a plan. Mm -hmm. Have a plan of action. Uh, make sure that whatever it is you're looking to get back into, whatever activity, recreation, that you get into it gradually. Um, that you incorporate stretching, and you incorporate warm-ups and cool-downs, and some sort of schedule in terms of not overdoing it, just making sure you're not at it every single day. And that can even be golf, you know? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're out there playing nine holes, you know, eight, nine holes, 18 holes. Some people are doing 36 holes in, in a day, in, you know, in a day. I mean, it's really, it's quite a lot, you know, it's a lot on the, on the body. What about sleep, hydration, nutrition, any of those things that you mentioned to patients or think are especially important? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's super critical whether we're post COVID or, or not. I, I think that's just should be part of anyone's um, health regimen. Um, sleep hygiene, having a, a, a really good kind of a diet, balanced diet, staying hydrated. I mean, all these things are really going to also help your performance. I think they're just good reminders because I think often when we think of exercise, so many people think, oh, how far can I run? How much can I lift? What score can I get on the golf course? Yeah. And as healthcare providers, we see the impact or the negative impact that sleep deprivation, dehydration, poor diet, stress, poor mental health can have on someone's performance and their um, risk of injuries as well. Yeah, I mean, look, it's in our nature to be competitive, no matter you know what you're doing or no matter how old you are. Mm -hmm. And you're competitive against other people, you're competitive against like your former self, like your past self. And as you get older, you know, sleep, sleep patterns change. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get as good sleep as you used to. Uh, there's more competing stresses and, and demands in life, so you may not be able to have the meals that you need or have the you know get the hydration that you need. 
So it's really important to kind of stay aware of it because it's really easy to forget. Do you think the general public's um, understanding of the need to take care of yourselves and people's willingness to exercise and take better care of themselves has evolved because of COVID? Oh, it's a tough question. I, I think people are always kind of aware. They may be more aware now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make it easier to execute it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're, oh yes, I should have done that, or I should be doing this, but instead I'm not, mm -hmm. right? Because again, you get distracted. You get distracted with life, and you get distracted with work. Um, you get distracted with, with kids. So I think the awareness is there. I think that the real hard part is just making it happen. But I do think that there's more awareness now post-COVID. It's always that execution. It's always the hard part. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, any major changes to the way that you're providing care? So if people are coming to see you for an injury or pain, any different cha any changes in your office? Well, the changes are really more in how I, um, how I assess the patients, mm -hmm. how I try to get a sense of their history or, or what may have led to the, to the injury. Um, is this an athlete that, that um, you know, would be typically doing a fall sport, but the fall sport got postponed and they're doing it now in the spring just because of COVID? Yeah. You know, it, have, have their uh, workout patterns changed because of the way uh, COVID has affected it? So for me, it's, it's more, okay, what are you doing? How is this different than how you would have done it before? Are you doing things in a different frequency, different duration? Are you doing it at a different time of year than you typically would, you know, whether it's a high school athlete, a collegiate athlete, or even like people that have like rec leagues that are, that are season specific. Um, all those get kind of changed around. And because of that, that actually does affect, you know, injury rates. It affects kind of how you approach this. Your body kind of gets used to routine. And once that routine breaks, um, then certain injuries can occur. It was actually interesting, the um, lacrosse season just ended. And it's felt like actually really nice lacrosse season because we were only ever in beautiful summer weather. Yeah. It wasn't very good for the athletes, and there were some who really suffered because of the heat because we were used to it being mm -hmm. earlier on the spring, and there was still a lot chillier. So even in that respect, I was sure. like, wow, how does that affect the athletes? Yeah, I mean, URI football, they had their season start this year at the end of February, yeah, yeah. which means that they were doing all their outdoor training during the month of February, yeah. right? So instead of like their preseason being in the dog days of August, mm -hmm. they're basically trying to rough it in these like, you know, blistering cold days in February. Yeah. And so the, the acclimation is totally different. Yeah. And these things do make a difference. So it is interesting to see how it will change their performance, not just this year or how it has changed, but also in the year to come. Um, any new sports or activities or um, leisure time activities that you're seeing people doing that they weren't doing before COVID? Yeah, I don't, uh, it's interesting to think about. Um, I think people, we spoke about awareness, right? Yep. And the awareness of trying to get more active. I think people are taking more chances on different types of things that are out there. You know, unique types of uh, workout programs like, yep. like boxing, mm -hmm. um, getting more to like CrossFit or these kind of gamut workouts or um, boot camps. So I think people are really trying to get more to those types of things. I think also because of COVID and the inability to have access to different resources, you learn to kind of make do with what you have. So that's why people are doing more things uh, that require like less, either like less equipment, less mm -hmm. gear, where they're easier to kind of set up outside. And I think that those those programs have kind of like taken. Mm -hmm. I did buy some rollerblades last week, so I'm. Huh. <laughs> yeah, it's good to bring rollerblades back, you know. I just say we go all the way to roller skates. <laughs> One of our PTs, I was really impressed that he um, we actually even did a podcast on it, bought rollerblades and showed how he was teaching himself how to rollerblade. So I think it's going to be the next thing. Yeah, I mean, I remember when, I remember when rollerblading <laughs> became a thing. I was in college in Boston, and I would go down to the Esplanade along the Charles River, yeah. and thinking I you know all geared up with my exactly. wrist guards and everything, and thinking we were super cool and exactly yeah. I don't know how cool you were, but... No, no, no. I was trying. I thought it would help. I thought it would help, yeah. All right, let's play a little game. 
Fact or fiction? Okay, love games. <laughs> <laughs> rest days. Are they necessary? So if someone's exercising, do you have to have rest days? So that's a tough one. I, oh, I, fact or fiction? Oh, you got to make it so black and white, huh? Yeah. I, I would say my gut is, is, um, is fiction. It is? Okay, mm -hmm. great. So what should we do on our um, rest, our so-called down days? Uh, cross train. Perfect. All right. Um, increased exercise will help me if I am feeling um, I'm feeling like I fatigue easily or don't have much energy. Energy. Uh, fact. Nice job. You must do twenty minutes of exercise or cardiovascular exercise in a day to get any positive change. Uh, fiction. Yeah. Stretching after a run or exercise will reduce your risk of injury. Uh, I would say fact. Tell us what kind of stretching that you'd recommend. Yeah, so there's all different kinds of stretching. Um, it's interesting because stretching seems pretty fundamental, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And you can actually get injured during the stretching not so much the activity you're stretching for. Statics, there's static stretching, there's dynamic stretching. A lot of data has been coming out uh, recently to support more dynamic stretching and more benefit with that. And uh, I mean, you could probably speak more to this about static stretching versus dynamic stretching and which one is done prior to workouts versus which one's done after workouts. But I know that there's some, some science that's coming out to that. Absolutely, and I just I think it's good to talk about stretching because so often I hear runners or golfers or swimmers saying, oh, I don't need to stretch. I've mm -hmm. never stretched. Why would I stretch? And I think people get it in their mind that stretching is, you know, down on the ground with one leg out, mm -hmm. reached over a hamstring and holding it for 30 seconds, and that's a stretch. You know, that is one kind of stretching, yeah. but stretching really is about optimizing your mobility and ensuring you're getting a good blood flow to all of those ligaments and tendons and joints and muscles so that they can remain healthy and yeah. optim and functioning in the most optimal way. Yeah, so I think people should be approaching their stretch portion the same way they're approaching their exercise. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm, I'm totally guilty of it. But, you know, people are like, they do this and this and like, okay, I'm good, you know? It's like a two second, mm -hmm. and, and they're constantly doing the bounce, and mm -hmm. then they go. Yep. And of course, you have the issues with overstretching, and we certainly see the impacts that that can have mm -hmm. when you um, put too much strain on those muscles yep. and tendons and, and yep. um, the ligaments and, um, and the muscle imbalances that it creates sure. because of it as well. You know, it's actually, along those lines, and piggybacking on some of the things we spoke about earlier about what types of new uh, activities kind of emerged out of COVID and injury patterns. So Peloton, mm -hmm. it, it was like this, it's, yeah. it was like totally gripped the U.S. Peloton couldn't have been happier with COVID. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of people come to me with a lot of like hip injuries, hip flexor injuries, uh, yeah. um, psoas injuries because – they just jump on the bike. It's not quite fitted correctly. They've never really done it before. And they're not stretching either. They just hop on and they go. Um, and so when I when I kind of push the patient on, like, did, did something happen? Uh, was there something that occurred, an injury? No, no, I, I can't even think of anything. And then I, well, was there anything you started that you weren't doing before? Well, I got a Peloton. And I'm telling you, I've had, like, not kidding, like, Ow. probably 10 patients over the last probably three weeks that have had the same story. Well, I did get a Peloton. I was like, yeah, okay. So tell me about that. How did you do? Were you cycling before? Did you ever do any spinning before that? No, I just wanted to do it. It was easy. You could order it. Comes to the house. Get an exercise program. How interesting. And as I think through it, I mean, I can see why people think this, is that you get on a bike. You don't think of it as, an, as a motion that you should stretch before or afterwards. Because right. you feel like you're going through a... A motion, so to speak. A motion that's almost like stretching you and out. You feel right? like you're stretched yeah, out. Yeah. 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 
Um, all right. Well, all of those spinners out there and peloton riders. Be very careful. Especially, I know there's a lot of middle-aged men out there who like to have competitions with each other mm -hmm. um, and challenge each other. You're, point, you're like staring at me when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is. I don't yeah. know if you're one of them, but I do hear Maybe. it from. I do, yeah. Yeah, see, yeah. I do hear, and you all like can compete against each other, and yeah. But if none of you are stretching at all, especially afterwards, right. um, you're going to end up. We should start calling it Peloton Hip. Yeah, we should. That's that's uh, that's catchy. It is. Yeah. Peloton hip. Maybe we'll put some stretches out after the, this about if you're on your peloton and mm -hmm. how to use your peloton Absolutely. to do some basic stretches. Use your peloton. There's some ways you can stand on it, stand around it, and use it mm -hmm. to um, optimize that strength, especially in that. So as those hip 100%. flexors. So yep. I don't think people realize those are big muscles in there, mm -hmm. they're strong muscles, but they attach to the front of your spine right. and can cause really major issues with your low back hip if they're right. too tight. And the number of revolutions that are yeah, occurring yeah. over the course of a 20, 30, yeah. 40 minute workout, yeah. yeah, it puts a lot of stress on that hip. Better be using those glute muscles and doing some strengthening in those glutes to yes. combat all of that. Absolutely. All right, I can't wait to put out this new series on yes. the Peloton hip. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. All right, last last question, fact or fiction. Exercise counteracts the impact of sitting all day. Uh, I would say fact. Yeah, it's a good one. We could talk about this for an hour because there's various amounts of research coming out mm -hmm. about this. Because, yeah, it's a challenge, especially for everyone who's working from home and they don't have a good workstation set up. Their yep. ergonomics isn't great. They sit all day. They probably work for even longer mm -hmm. because you get up in the morning, get your coffee, and you sit. Yeah, I'm always encouraging people to get stand-up desks if, if available. You Absolutely. Know, talk to HR, see what they have available, and try to work that out. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love the stand-up desks. We see them all around in yeah. our offices yeah, for sure. Yeah, sure. All right, what are you most excited about for the summer? Uh... The fact that I can go out in crowds and be maskless and engage back in live music and yeah. go to festivals and just be social. I know. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any final words of wisdom for the listeners out there who are thinking, oh, maybe I have been trying to lift a little bit much weight or run a little too far? I mean, just, just, just think. Use common sense and, and just... Take a moment to just think about exactly what it is you're doing and how you want to do it. Yep. And you'll get there. And just, you'll get there. Yeah. It's all about patience. you got to crawl before you run. Yes, I know, I know. I'm not a patient person, but it's about patience. Exactly. Dr. Tabitol, thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. um, your words of wisdom are much appreciated. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome, Kevin Alexander. I am so pleased you are able to join us on this show, which we are really talking about summertime and summertime injuries. I've talked to lots of people in this show so far, this episode, in regard to the injuries we're seeing because suddenly people are getting out and running, rollerblading, pelotoning, and um, let's say they are also out on the golf course. Have you been out on the golf course, Kevin? Yeah, quite a bit. Try and get out at least twice a week. I love it. Are you um, game enough to tell us what your handicap is? Uh, right now I'm at about a 12. So. Good. That's impressive. So you obviously know what you're talking about as a golfer as well as a physical therapist who sees lots of um, patients down there at East Greenwich Clinic. I'm sure you see plenty of golfers and have some advice for them. So for our golfers who may be suddenly spending too much time at the driving range or jumping out and, and trying to do 18 holes or 36 holes even, what are some of the things that they can do to minimize the risk of some of the common ailments that golfers come to you with? Sure. So I'd say probably the number one thing golfers come to PT for is back pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's also one of the most common things that people experience in general, but particularly in golfers, because they're spending about like four or five hours in a bent over position and pretty aggressively rotating. So one thing that they can do to kind of help prevent that is, um, you know, doing a proper warm up, doing some stretching, not just getting out of the car and, you know, trying to smash your first drive. So doing some simple warm-up exercises that you can usually find online, um, something like W-turns where you basically hinge at the waist and turn side to side. 
trying to warm up the shoulders, um, trying to warm up the back. Those are pretty good. Uh, if you have issues trying to figure out what to do, you can always come to a physical therapist and they can kind of come, come up with a plan for your individual issue. Um, another thing that we really see common with golfers is golfer's elbow or tendonitis at the elbow. That's something that's a little trickier. Uh, usually that has to do with them over gripping the club. They're squeezing too hard, basically. So there's a couple things they can do temporarily if you're experiencing that. You can use an elbow brace so that way you can at least get out to the golf course and play. Sometimes that can provide enough relief. But ultimately, if it's not getting better in a couple weeks, you're probably going to want to come see a PT to help you get over that issue. And you may want to see a swing coach to figure out why it is that you're over gripping the club because that sometimes is a compensation for something that's breaking down with your swing. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that you bring that up, that golfer's elbow is not just really a problem with the elbow. It's actually a problem with your technique and a problem with your gripping, with, with your grip. So actually learning how to participate in the activity the right way, just like knowing how to run properly and having the right running shoes, just like knowing how to be on a peloton correctly and cycle and have the seat at the right height are actually great ways for you to ensure that you continue to enjoy those activities. If someone hasn't played golf before, give us a little bit of a um, get some suggestions or give us some advice and how someone should ramp up to actually be able to comfortably physically play 18 holes like should you spend some time at the driving range should you start with nine holes should you start with three holes you know how do you ramp up to being able to be like yeah i can enjoy a full round well full round of golf yeah that's a great question so i definitely recommend people spend some time at the driving range trying to hit the ball first i wouldn't recommend going straight to the golf course because there's a lot involved you know there's you know certain golf etiquette just like in any sport um, and there's just, it's a lot harder to hit a ball that doesn't move than you think it would be. So it's worth practicing that. Um, and if you're having difficulty, I definitely recommend getting at least one or two lessons to learn the ropes of, you know, the rules and the basics of the swing. Um, definitely if you're not a very active person, get out and go for walks, try and get your cardiovascular, um, you know, conditioning up a little bit because walking nine holes can be pretty hilly and it can be tiring depending on what course you play. Um, but other than that, I think, you know, starting with nine holes makes sense for most people because unless you have a membership somewhere, you can't really get out and just play three. And I think it's not worth going straight to 18 because it can be pretty frustrating if you're not doing well. So it's worth just playing nine, maybe going back to the range a few days later and, and try and work on the, the things that you're having difficulty with. Um, that sounds a lot more enjoyable to me because the thought of going out and playing 18 holes of golf, I'm worried what my stress levels would be like at the end. I feel like I would have actually injured someone with a golf course out of a golf club out of frustration. Yeah, it, it, can be, it can be difficult. And that's why, you know, you want it to be fun. So don't put yourself in a situation where you, it's not going to be fun. Uh, where do you play, Kevin? Which golf course or courses? I play all over the place, um, you know, mostly in southern Rhode Island, but I'll make trips up to northern Rhode Island and Massachusetts to see my in-laws. So uh, I'd say I play North Kingstown Golf Course or uh, Quonset a lot because it's right near my house. I play Rolling Greens, Exeter, Richmond, Beaver River, Meadowbrook, you name it. Well, all those spots sound um, beautiful and sound like a great way to see and experience Rhode Island. So for all of our Rhode Islanders or people from surrounding states, please check out those golf courses and the driving ranges. Um, first steps, what if someone doesn't have any golf clubs? What would you suggest they do? So, again, you can rent. Some places will rent golf clubs, not all of them. Um, so you would want to call ahead to the golf course and see if that's even an option. Um, otherwise what I would do is I'd go to a driving range with a friend who has some golf clubs to make sure this is something that you want to make a little bit of an investment with. Um, you can get cheaper sets of golf clubs at like Dick's Sporting Goods. That comes with the bag. It comes with a putter, um, pretty much everything you need to get started. And that's usually, and when I say inexpensive, it's probably around like three or $400, but that's a basic set of what you need. And then once you decide if it's something that you're going to really kind of continue to play the rest of your life you can go for a higher end set of clubs. I wouldn't recommend going right to the really expensive ones. Well, thank you. I'm sure you've encouraged lots of people to try golf or to continue to pursue their game and do whatever they can to minimize the risk of any injuries and, play and injury and pain so they can play the sport forever. Finally, what do you love about golf? Why do you play golf? 
Well, I think the, the thing I really enjoy about golf is that, you know, you can make it a social event. You can go with your friends. Um, it can be a lot of fun in that sense, but you don't have to. You can go out by yourself. Um, you can get paired up with random people and get to meet new people. Other times you get to go out completely by yourself and just play the course and just enjoy being outside. Uh, it's just one of those few sports where it's so versatile and it's really just you against the course. Well, thank you, Kevin. All the best. I hope that your handicap continues to go down, which is a positive thing for those who are not golfers. Maybe you'll get it to um, single figures by the end of the summer. I and so. I, really, <laughs> I really love what you said, that it really is about the fun and enjoyment because at the end of the day, moving and exercising and all the activities that we want to do is all about enjoying our lives and staying injury and pain free. So thanks, Kevin. My pleasure. Fact or fiction, don't you like it how I tried to trip up Kevin Alexander in regard to the fact or fiction question? Let's see what you have to say. When it comes to hydration, you just need to drink a lot enough. It doesn't matter what you drink. How do you respond to that? I, I love to say that's a fact, but I think that's I think that's fiction. You know, if we're talking about a, a certain cocktail or wine at the end of a workout, I think it's okay to use as a reward. But I wouldn't count that as your rehydration uh, approach. <laughs> well, I'm pleased you agree with Kevin on that one. Sleep came up a lot as well. I'm interested in your thoughts of this one, sleep deprivation. When you feel sleep deprived, should you rest and take a cat nap? Or should you think, I'm going to power through and go for a run? Yeah, there's honestly, I guess it depends on the person. There's some research to back up both. In some cases, a, a, a cat nap or a little power nap at a certain time of day can help people's concentration throughout. Um, but I'd say that cat nap shouldn't be trying to catch up on sleep you're missing at night, right? So good sleep health is, is fundamental. Over the last year, there was a new term called coronasomnia because so many people were losing out on sleep because of the stress and fear surrounding, you know, the coronavirus and the lockdown. Um, and they said it was roughly four in 10 people having sleep issues. That's on top of a lot of people that had issues to begin with, right? A lot of Americans with our lifestyle, we don't have great sleep to begin with. So we get back to physical activity, pushing through and doing a little bit of activity every day has been proven to have a really good effect on reversing that coronasomnia and helping good sleep habits. And again, it goes right back to that 10 minute a day rule or just start at 10 minutes and build up to 30 and you're going to sleep better and it has a really positive cycle. I do like that name coronasomnia. Um, it kind of goes along with the COVID-19 when it comes to the weight that people are putting on. Uh, Jen Galland is up next. She was actually the Rhode Island ATA Athletic Trainer of the Year. So I call her our AT Athletic Trainer extraordinaire. I have a feeling when she talks about our students out there, sleep is going to come to one of the top of the list of things that our student athletes need to be aware of. Yeah, congratulations to Jen. We know how great you are at performance, and I'm glad everybody else can see it. And yeah, I bet especially in that the age group you work with, that, that plays a huge role in, in addressing sleep health. Um, I am here with athletic trainer extraordinaire Jen Gallant. Jen, it's great to have you here. You have managed to get through the pandemic and help our student athletes get through the pandemic. Some missing their seasons, some getting late seasons, some you know playing on surfaces they weren't used to because of the changes in temperatures. It's all over the place. Uh, I know that we're sort of into summer now, and I hear that there's still some competition going on. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, the Rhode Island Interscholastic League is just wrapping up their playoffs. Um, we should all be done by the beginning of July. Um, this is the latest we've ever played, but we're, like you said, hanging in there, and summer is on the way. So tell us a little bit about what students should be doing this summer. Their schedules are all sort of out of whack. Hopefully next year there'll be some level of normalcy. How do we help our middle school, high school, collegiate athletes know what the best thing is to do for the summer? I think the best thing to do is take care of your bodies, uh, listen to your body, rest is key this summer. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a, a crazy whirlwind of a year that we, you know, we accomplished a lot and it's, it's now time to give that body a rest no matter what sport you played. Um, it's very important to stay on top of your nutrition and be very aware of what you're intaking this summer and continue to keep a nice routine of a schedule even though you're not in classes every day. Yeah.
Great point about the routine as I watch my teenagers, well, one of them in particular, sleep later and later every day. <laughs> Some of them are going to go on to get ready for pre-season in the fall, um, which definitely can be intense. How do you make sure that kids are ready for pre-season? Uh, I, even if you're not specifically practicing your sports skill, I think it's important to stay active every day. Mm -hmm. um, biking, swimming, any, anything that you are able to do, even if it is going for a jog in your neighborhood, keep that routine going. You know, Try to make time for exercise every day and um, always have a dynamic warm-up. Always you know, continue to take care of any previous injuries you've had or seek out help if you need them. Um, but this is definitely the recovery period right now during the summer, and it will help you so much more when August rolls around. Great point. So keep moving. Keep thinking about dynamic warm-ups, cardiovascular, some strengthening, some stretching, stretching. Prepare your body for the year to come. It's going to be a great year. Tell me, fact or fiction, Jen, does stretching help to minimize the risk of injuries? I would say fact. Okay, I mean, we could argue it either way. Should people stretch before they exercise or afterwards? I would say a little of both. Okay. I would definitely say a little of both. Speak a little bit about the difference between before stretching and after stretching. How is it different? Um, I would definitely incorporate more of a dynamic movement to start and get those muscles warm and ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, afterwards, I mean, you can continue to do a little bit of dynamic stretching if needed, but more of a static cool-down stretch. Make sure your body is feeling well in each of those specific areas. Um, I think it's both are very important for your body. All right, great points. Jen Gallant, thank you so much. Hear that everyone out there, work on those dynamic stretches, especially before you participate in exercise, a little bit more sustained with some dynamic afterwards, and you will be ready for the next season. Thanks, Jen. Have a great summer. Thanks, Michelle. Well, here I am today. I took off my high-heeled shoes so I could come down and run an errand. I am with Patrick Moulton at our local running store, Road Runner, encouraging everyone who's out there to support your local running stores. What a great way to stay healthy. Patrick, you just told me before lots of people are coming into the stores. Are these new runners, old runners, people are returning to running? Who's coming into your store to buy sneaks all, these days? All of the above. So yeah. we got our regular runners who've been running all the time. We got new runners, which is really nice to see. You know, people who picked up running during the pandemic, just as some, you know, way to get in shape, because uh, they couldn't go to the gyms any longer. So, and they've been really enjoying it. So, it's been nice to kind of help them, guide them along, and making the right purchases for footwear, um, and see new runners really excited about the sport, which is really nice. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, are you seeing people coming in with complaints? Are people running too much or the wrong way or poor footwear? What are you hearing from customers? Oh, we see all of the above. So, like, you know, I we have new runners that come in here and, you know, kind of look at their gates and they don't really know quite how to run. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of give them a point, you know, because we watch them run on the track while they're overstriding or landing too far up on their toes or heel striking. We can kind of give them some recommendations on proper run running technique. Love it. Um, so that's that's kind of rewarding because a lot of people really don't know how to run. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, if you're a new runner, you want to develop good habits, you know, to, to start running and stay healthy. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we, we see our regular runners, but you know, it's been good. It's been good. I love the fact that, this is why I always support people going to their local running store because people think you should just to be able to run naturally. You know, we all should just know how to run. But when you take up running, or if you're setting a goal, like I'm going to suddenly want to run further or faster or run a marathon or whatever it is, we don't actually all automatically know the best techniques. Oh, so totally. it's so important to get and those Especially new things. runners. Yeah. Develop good habits early. Mm -hmm. you know, that way you can stay healthy. You exactly. know? And technique is really wasn't an... Even back in the day when I was running competitively, they normally really talked about running form until like the last couple of years. So, but. And you and I are still running. You're about to turn 40. I'm about to turn a decade older than that. Yeah. You're not competing anymore. But what do your running goals look like these days? My running goals, like I said, like uh, I want to run every day this year. You know, uh, running, I love running. It makes me feel good. Um, so to get out there every day has been my goal. So, you know, in the past, I had a minimum of five miles. But I had to, like this year, as long as I get out and do three miles, uh, I'm happy. So it's been, been making me able to get out there and run consistently. <laughs> I just it make I, first of all everyone who's listening please don't use that as a reason to get out and run every day <laughs> because it's yeah, probably not the best but I just think it's awesome 
I, I mean, because you are someone who is, was an elite runner, ran a massive amount, and um, to know that your goal is just to run every day and you're doing it, we're almost halfway through the year and you're doing it, I think it's so awesome. Yeah, and honestly, like, I, in, in order for me to run every day, I had to take some, like, recommendations by you yep. just to kind of stay healthy because I had some hamstring issues and Achilles issues that, you know, I, so I developed more of a routine in the morning to kind of help them strengthen those areas and become a little bit more flexible. So for me, that's kind of really helped me stay more injury-free, so. Well, it's like this is an advertisement. For no, it. I, I didn't <laughs> well, no. mean to, you know, No, no, it's perfect. It tells us, I still remember many years ago, trying to convince you that maybe a little strengthening, stretching would actually help you and not very, just feel better. And you kind of would be like, whatever, old lady, what would you no, know? No, no, I'm very stubborn. So, like, <laughs> that's my wife. Like, I'm very stubborn. So, like, for me, like, as a runner and being competitive, I used to gut through things and just kind of run through it and just magically it would get better. But, like, as I get older, like, almost at my 40, 40 years old this year, uh, you know, I want to run until my later years in life. So, for me... I want to be more proactive and be able to, like, you know, you know, stay injury free. So that's why I've been kind of developing more of a routine for that kind of stuff. Now. Tell us about your routine, Patrick. What exercises do you yeah, do? Yeah, so in the morning I do push ups, sit ups, I do a lot of core work, um, and I do some bridges because of my hamstring. Um, my Achilles, I've been doing some heel lifts um, on a stair. Uh, nothing too crazy. I do some, like, resistance bands, um, but just like, you know, about 10 minutes of exercises during the morning, every morning. And uh, definitely help me out. So, you know, I, I would recommend like some strengthening routine or just like some kind of routine, as, especially for beginner runners, to kind of make sure they stay healthy. So before this, before we started talking, Patrick asked me, he says, what else should I do? So um, I thought we could have a little challenge now and see how good your balance is. Single oh, leg no, deadlift no. is the exercise of choice for me. So I thought I am going to work on a single leg deadlift, but I think you should do it at the same time. Oh, man. This is my and, first deadlift. I uh, know. So single leg deadlift, one foot on the ground. Hold your core muscles in nice and tight. You're going to bend from your hips. You're going to keep a little bit of a bend in the knee that you're on. And you're going to think of yourself tipping forward from that hip. As you come down, you're going to keep your head up, keep your chest up, keep looking up. Extend that left leg behind you and really squeeze that left glute. Hold it up there. You should feel like a ballerina or a oh, yogi. Yeah. I could feel it. You can even put your arms out in front of you. You can even do a little squat while you're you here. You make me look bad. I know. That's exactly right. And I even have a skirt on. So that's, I mean, <laughs> yeah, a little I awkward, but that's okay. But this is a phenomenal exercise because it works your balance. It works your strength. Oh, ooh, it works your, it also stretches out your hamstrings, it works things in what we call an eccentric way, so a great exercise to add in there for runners, walkers, not runners, and even everyone else. No matter what you oh, do. that's great, and uh, I'm going to add that to my, my morning routine, definitely. And then next time I'll challenge you to do it. Yeah, I'll do time. better, like, I was pretty, like, shaky, and uh, so next time I'll... I thought I'd challenge you to push-ups too. Uh, push-ups are pretty uh, good. Yeah, yeah, we were not going to do that one. <laughs> you, know, you had your chance. All right, so I'm here to get some sneakers today. Tell me, here's what I envision as one of the questions that you hear a lot, and then I'm going to ask you what the key questions are. Should I be wearing a big, squishy, comfy shoe, or should I be, minim be wearing a more minimalist shoe or a more supportive shoe? Like, What do you tell customers about what kind of sneakers they should be wearing? Yeah, so I really like... I want to know a lot about the customer's history and what they like to be running in. And everyone's gait's different, everyone's yeah. preferences are different. So, you know, it's really understanding what you want in a running shoe. Yeah. Um, most of the time, I don't really quite put people in minimalist shoes unless they like a more minimal experience. Because mm -hmm. uh, it takes some time to adjust to a minimal shoe. So I, I typically put more people in a little bit more support for running shoes, especially if they're first starting out. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, what are some key things, if I'm someone who's you know, a new runner, or even an experienced runner, what should a shoe feel like? Should I have to break it in? No. So Good. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's comfort. Yep. Key. That's the yep. most important. We tell customers, oh, I don't know what shoe to pick. Think of the shoe that you notice the least on your foot. What yep. feels more natural to you and what feels comfortable? Comfort comfortable is what you want to go with. Great. Yeah. Does it make a big difference if I'm choosing to run on trails versus road versus climbing rocks? Should I look at the tread? Should I consider oh, totally. trail versus not? If you're doing most of your running on a trail, like you're going to have a trail, a little, you know, a trail shoes definitely would, would help you out. A little bit more traction. Mm -hmm. It protects your feet from rocks. 
um, you know, a little bit lower to the ground so you're able to move a little bit easier and navigate the trails a little bit easier. So if you're running primary and trails, I would invest in a trail shoe. But for the most part, if someone's running on the road and the trail, I pretty much like recommend a running shoe, for, like a regular running shoe Great. for most people because a trail shoe is not as comfortable on the road. Yeah. You know, Great. so. Good, good point to there because I always wonder, I always have both and if I'm going to go for a run that combines both, I'm like, what do I choose? But knowing I should stick to that road shoe. Yeah, and most of the trails easier. people run on are pretty, they're not too technical. Yeah. So they can get away with a running shoe pretty easily, a regular running shoe. That's awesome. Any final tips or advice for people who are purchasing running shoes of things that they should watch out for or certain questions they should ask people who are helping Honestly, in the like, store? Um, coming in the shop, like... All of our staff, like, we're here to guide you along and make the right purchase. So like, we'll look at your gait, we'll assess your gait, we'll see your preferences, we'll look at your foot shape, and kind of really make sure, we, you know, get the right shoe for you. That's perfect. Patrick, and to the rest of the team at Roadrunner, thank you. Thank and you. thank you for serving our community and keeping everyone out there moving and running and walking. You too. Thank you. So, Dave, we all know what kind of sneakers we should be wearing now. We know we need to sleep and hydrate and not just with beer. We need to be aware if we're on the peloton of stretching and dynamic stretching, both before and a little bit more static afterwards based on some advice we've had. Um, we've learned about strength training and we've learned about not building up too quickly. So there's a lot that's been covered today for all of those golfers, runners, rollerbladers, swimmers, kayakers, student athletes, weekend warriors, you're all, all out there. Um, what are your final words of wisdom or pieces of advice as a physical therapist and one that actually leads our entire clinical team at Performance? So you look closely at the literature, at the research, and work really closely with our entire clinical team. Give us some final words of wisdom for our community. Yeah, thank you to the guests you had. I learned a ton. That was really interesting. And to me, the theme feels like Find some physical activity that fits into your lifestyle, um, whether it's running, whether it's using that new Peloton. But to me, we, we spent, we had such a tough year, everybody did. And yet from the guests you had, you can see there's so many people out there who are willing to help, willing to offer advice. So I think of it as an opportunity for everybody to create new habits, to, to, to be more physically active and happier and healthier than they've ever been coming into this new season and, and this summer that we're about to have. Thank you, Dave. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening. Send any questions our way. We are here to help and ensure that you get better, faster, and forever. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Performance Physical Therapy Better Faster Podcast.